Hello everyone, I'm Alan Hyde and welcome to the Barking Mad podcast, the official podcast of the British Automobile Racing Club, where we delve in to some of the most on-trend topics in motorsport and speak to some of the biggest personalities that work within the industry. Now this is episode five, which I can scarcely believe we're whizzing through them. Um, And as always, we've got another fantastic show lined up. Before we get going, though, it's time to introduce my barking mad co-host, waving at the camera, Ian Waterhouse. (laughs) Hi, Ian. How are you doing? Uh, Alan, I'm very, very well. Do you know what? The the hairs on the back of my neck always go up in a good way when I hear the, your, your dulcet tones coming on to start this uh, podcast. And, and it's been a couple of weeks, of course, since I saw you. So, Alan, what have you been up to? Um, uh, doing quite a lot of miles in the car, I have to say. So a couple of weeks ago, it was touring cars at Croft. We talked about it on the previous podcast. Um I also had to go up there early to do a feature with the Napa Racing UK drivers, Dan Camish and um, nice. uh, Dan Dan Camish and Dan Robottom, um, and uh, so that was in Leeds. And then we went to Croft, and then we came back down, and then I went straight up to Silverstone for MotoGP last week. So so two two world action last weekend, um, and wow. uh, back to touring cars again this weekend. What about yourself? Well, a bit like you, actually. We get very familiar with the M1 and the A1. I've been to, to Thruxton. I've been up to Leeds, like yourself. I've been up to Leeds. I've been up to Darlington. I've been to Sunny Barnet and um, Brands Hatch as well. Uh, so, yeah, quite a lot been going on, quite a lot coming up as well. But as we're on the, the topic, Alan, of moving around and going to different places and different circuits as well, I've often wondered if you could just go to one circuit for the rest of your life. So there's only one circuit left in the world but it's going to be your choice of what circuit it is. Where would it be? Okay, well, I might have two. I might have a cheeky two. <sighs> that is cheeky. If you are being very, very strict and saying only one. <laughs> no, you can have two. <laughs> okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, so it would be Thruxton, which has, uh, it's, it's kind of been a special place in my life. It was the first place I ever commentated. I had no intention of becoming a commentator um i just loved motor racing um happened to be in the right place at the right time it was the place that um i did my first ever commentary at various points during my life it's been of huge personal significance uh thrux and circuit also it is incredibly quick it requires an incredible set of skills that the racing drivers don't need for um, every other circuit in the UK. It is incredible. Oh, yeah. And I was really good at it in the Nissan Primera on Toka 2. Uh, I could blitz a race there. Couldn't do anywhere, anywhere else. But but Thruxton flat out around the back. I was mega. You could actually see the bonnet bouncing up and down. And the other circuit that I'd have, apart from Thruxton, would be Macau. And nice. I mean, nice choice. For, for the last 10 years, I've been privileged enough to do the World Feed commentary at Macau. Um, and it, it, it is always a privilege when I arrive there. It is um, a, a place unique. There is nothing like it in the world. It requires extreme bravery with it's a street circuit. It's got barriers all the way around the circuit. It is in, in parts incredibly quick. Um, and um it well it fits in it's barking mad uh, it, it it is an incredible place but barking mad well alan if you're going to have a cheeky two i'm going to have a cheeky two as well my first one uh, like you actually is also thruxton uh, because of course it is the home of the barc so that's why i choose thruxton as one uh, ian waterhouse <laughs> never knowing stop the looking off-brand. at me like that alan no i like it stop no, looking at me good. like that <laughs> really my good. second is, is is actually Brands Hatch same reason for you for Thruxton really it was the first um, track uh, first circuit I actually did any professional work in motorsport so it's quite dear to me uh, if you're watching this on YouTube as well tell us which is yours in the comments section I'd love to know in fact I want to find out which is the most popular circuit across the world so do put in the comments the circuit that you think is the best doesn't have to be UK based could be absolutely anywhere in the world and uh, I'll take a little look through the comments next time I get a chance. Uh, but Alan, we've got a lot coming up, haven't we? Uh, we certainly have. That's a really good idea. Yeah, get your comments coming in. I bet most people come up with personal reasons, uh, very personal reasons why a circuit is 
we'll put the reasons in as well. Name the circuit and yeah, the yeah. reason. We'd love to. We can uh, we can even maybe read them some out on the next podcast. Who knows? Absolutely. Yeah, good idea. Absolutely right. Uh, well, uh, like Ian said, like I've said, we've got another brilliant show lined up. But first, it's time to tell you all about our fantastic partners. Now, if you're a BARC member, you can invest less on fuel and more on winning. The Barking Mad podcast is proudly partnered with BP Fleet Solutions UK to bring BARC members and podcast listeners exclusive discounts on UK fuel. Now, the BP Plus fuel and charge card can be used at 3,400 locations, offers 6p per litre off both standard and ultimate grade fuels at 1,200 UK fuel stations. And there's also significant savings on electric vehicle charging too. Yeah, the BP Plus fuel and charge card can be used by anyone. Individuals, race teams, SMEs and entire vehicle fleets can all access great savings at BP fuel stations. The collaboration between Bark and BP marks a significant milestone in providing benefits to racing drivers, teams and their associated businesses. Now, if you're a Bark member and you want to save money on your fuel, head over to bp.com slash BARC. And if you need any help at all or want more information, please hit the callback button on the website and a member of the BP Fleet Solutions UK will contact you. And for those of you that are not members of the BARC but still want to receive great rates on fuel and electric charging, head over to applynow.bpplus.co.uk. Fantastic stuff. Now, in the last uh, episode of the Barking Mad podcast, you may remember we were running our Draper Tools competition to win the Evolution Luxury Workstool and Luxury Steel Mechanics Creeper. Uh, that has now closed. So that competition, the Draper Tools competition, has now closed. But we will be in touch with the winner very soon. So if you did take part in that competition, uh, just uh, keep your eyes peeled because we here at the BARC will be in touch with you very, very soon. Anyway, Ian, uh, it's time to have a good old natter about all things motorsport. This is the Barking Mad Podcast. Now, we start this episode like we always do by talking all things bark. And of course, we couldn't do that without the man, the myth, the event manager who has become a part of the furniture. Well, almost. Everybody knows that David... And everybody knows David Whedon. How are we? Good, thanks. Afternoon, chaps. Afternoon, David. Uh, you're in a different environment. Where are you today? I am at home. Summer holidays, so I am looking after my son yesterday and today. And then I'll um, ship them off to the sister-in-law for the rest of the week. So, so, you, so you've had a busy time, busy time uh, away from work and a busy time with work. I know last time we spoke, you were about to head to Thruxton, I think, was it? Yes, I was. I, How did um, it go, David? Because you were racing, weren't you? It, it went all right. Um, qualified well. Um, race one was really wet and I was on cut slick, so I went backwards in that one. Um, and then my second race, I went forwards and finished 11th. I wanted a top 10. I was only four attempts of a second off at the line from a top 10, but I was quite pleased. I went forward, not backwards. So, What was it um, like racing with the track attack? Yeah, really good. Really good fun. Um, the Peugeot 206 guys are fantastic. Um, Paul yeah. Rice and, and them boys there, they are really, really good to race with. I had some, some great dices with them um, in the second race. and um, Yeah, really, really good club to race with. Are we going to see you back out on track again this year, David? I don't know yet. Maybe. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. How long have you raced for yourself, David? Many, many years. Many, many years. I wouldn't even like to put a figure on it. North and of what did you start 30. in? Um, did some karting and stuff when I was younger, and then did some cars, and then had a big, long sort of break where I didn't do any racing, and then sort of two or three years ago, got got back into it. So. Uh, good stuff, David. Uh, let's take a look at what's coming up, shall we, uh, across the motorsport landscape. And the British Touring Car Championship is back, of course. Uh, Croft hosted, a, well, kick-started the second half of the season. But this weekend, it's over to Knock Hill. Yeah, um, fantastic little circuit um, north of the border. And obviously, our only um, travels outside of England, actually, considering it's British Touring Car Championship. It, it's the only time we actually do go outside of um, the English um Borders, but um, yeah, fantastic circuit. Um, not massive, but beautiful, beautiful views. Um, 
and always always great racing the story of the btcc this year is phenomenal um because napa racing uk have done amazing things with their ford focus ash sutton has activated god mode um and is <laughs> thoroughly incredible he's just been incredible however for the last two meetings croft included has had an incident which has meant that he had a, a no point scoring in the final race so the net result although ash is is fully in god mode um tom ingram is still only six points behind i mean six oh. points behind bearing in mind ash has had seven wins so far this year compared to tom's i think he's had one win two wins maybe um but uh it, it it is fascinating how this season is panning out. You would imagine that Ash will, will be winning the championship at the next meeting at Donington, but it is far from that. Yeah, exciting, isn't it? It really it just goes to show consistency is key, isn't it, Alan? Oh, w without a shadow of a doubt. And um, I, whenever anybody says that, particularly about the BTCC, I always remind them, was it 2018? I think it was 2018. Colin Turkington won the title having only won one race during the season at Alton Park during it's the year. Uh, but the consistent point scoring, the podiums, the fifth, the sixth places that he was getting consistently across the season. At the end of the year, it added up. He was champion. And while we're on the subject of the BTCC, uh, David, the Rocket F4 British Championship certified by FIA uh, recently announced that it will remain on the TOCA support bill um, until at least the end of 2026. That's a that's a big thing. It's a big championship. It's a big thing to be on the TOCA support bill. But to go all the way through until the end of not next year, not the year after, but the year after that, that's pretty impressive stuff. Yeah, I mean... Let's be fair. It's the the from a from a um, Formula One license point of view, it's the Premier Series really in the country. I would say, um, and therefore you want that to be on the Premier package. Obviously, with touring cars with the live TV, with ITV, etc. It's it's sort of um, head and shoulders above above sort of all of its competition with regards to the commercial side. So I think it makes sense for the the F4 package to stay with Toka and, and together hopefully we can produce some more sort of top flight Formula 1 drivers and IndyCar drivers and sports car drivers coming out of the, the grassroots single seaters in this country. I think potentially this year in, in British F4, um, David, it is, it is more international than ever we've known it. One thing that TSL uh, Timing do on the mobile app now is they, they put the little flag of the nation of the driver and when you look down, it's it's a it's a proper mix from all over the world, which for me reminds me of British F three uh, back in the nineteen eighties. I think one of the best things they did was had them um, parity with the Italian series when Formula Four came about initially. It was the Italian series that was the strongest by far, um, and and now we've gone to the same chassis and same engines. Um, again, from from an F four point of view, there's some cross pollination there. I can imagine there's some drivers probably raced in both. Um, uh, and it's gradually pulling the British Championship up to to be one of the best F4 series in the world. Really is, yeah. We 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 can be proud of this. Definitely the route to uh, the the step by step guide to Formula One, isn't it, uh, David? A little bit earlier, we we touched on. Of course, you were with Track Attack at the Thruxton Summer Festival, but it was a lot going on, wasn't there? Caterings were there as well. Junior saloons were there. Classic modern motorsport club. It was a packed uh, packed couple of days, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously, we had some guest championships with CMMC coming, um, and there were some fa fantastic looking cars out in the, the CMMC on the Saturday. Um, Marcus Bicknell has a, I think it's an ass car, I think it's one of the Rockingham cars, but it's it's painted up as the, the yellow um, NASCAR, and it, and it just sounded and, and well, it sounded amazing, went like a rocket ship, so that was, that was good on Saturday. Um, but yeah, the, the junior saloons, again, some of their races were fantastic. I mean, they just have zero fear. Um, and as someone who was racing in the same conditions as them that weekend in a little sacks on myself, I mean, watching them come into the chicane three or four wide, um, you've got to give them all a pat on the back. I mean, the, the racing was, was really, really good. It's important to remember, isn't it? The junior saloons, they're 14 to 17 year olds. And like yeah. you say, they are fearless. I mean, imagine that. Imagine being 14 years, of, years old and then going back to school on the Monday and saying, oh, yeah, I was, I was racing at Thruxton at the weekend. It's pretty cool, isn't it? 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think as well, we had the caterings, obviously, and there was um, seas and seas of caterings. I've never seen so many caterings before, to be totally honest with you. Um, it's the first time this year where I've um, actually looked after um, or been at a race meeting with the, 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 the a lot of the caterings. I did a Silverstone meeting earlier this year where there was one one of the catering series or two, but there was um, four there last weekend and there was just caterings everywhere. But um, they race in packs. Did anyone see the guy, the, 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 the little incident at the at the last corner of the, the last lap? Yes. Um, I think it was in the road sports. Don't quote me on that. But um, the guy in the yellow, the yellow one who was running third got through for the win because the, the two leaders took themselves out of the last corner. Yeah. Um, and it was just, uh, you couldn't put a cigarette paper between them at some points. It was um, it was really, really great close racing. Yeah, caterings put on a spectacle, don't they? They do, they do. It is the final race meeting of the season, though, at the home of Bark this weekend. Uh, Kurt Sidibane, it's British Superbike Championship, David. Yeah, um, I don't follow superbikes as much as I used to. I, I, I won't lie to you, I've, n- I've never really followed bikes, apart from I was a huge Carl Fogarty fan when I was about nine or ten years old. So I was a, a massive fan of World Superbikes in sort of the mid-90s, when I think it was at its, its peak, its heyday. But um, the British Superbikes... Um, I won't lie to you, you think a BTCC meeting's busy, you want to come to a superbike meeting at Fruxton because it it just dwarfs anything from a spectator point of view. Um, it's just huge. You never see as many people uh, as you you do at a superbike meeting. Um, it, it's always a... I always enjoy sitting in the office on a Friday. I open all the windows because um, obviously they test on the Friday. Um, so it's um, an orchestra of superbikes and, and super stocks and super sports. Um, from nine nine till five on the Friday, usually the, the weekend of the superbike meeting. So I um, I don't mind that one at all. To be fair, last last couple of years, David, I've been lucky enough to be um, the uh, BSB radio presenter uh, at cer- certain uh, BSB meetings, the ones that don't clash with touring cars. Um, so so this weekend we have the unique uh, opportunity for. A, a BSB presenter who lives 10 minutes away from Thruxton travelling up to Knock Hill Circuit in Scotland and the Knock Hill Circuit commentator Duncan Vincent who is also the principal commentator for BSB travelling down from Knock Hill to Thruxton <laughs> Clashes have houses, been Alan. the bane of my life I should have rented it out to him <laughs> but for the fact I'm not sure I would particularly trust him and now one of the biggest events of the summer take i don't mean that duncan uh, one of the biggest i would trust you uh, one yes, of the <laughs> biggest events of the summer takes place uh, at donnington park david this weekend in the shape of the convoy in the park let me give you a, a flavor of what what to expect five british truck racing championship headliners uh, whilst uh, the all new international truck pre uh, takes place um, uh, makes its debut with the uh, likes of John McGuinness um, uh, at the will of a uh, yeah John McGuinness MBE um, uh, at the will of a, a of a race truck. This is going to be quite a weekend at Donington, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I am looking forward to the International Truck Pre. Um, that one's shaping up to be quite a, a good um, sort of four or five races this weekend. Um, John McGuinness, as you said, is racing in there. Um, and then we've got a lot of um, European trucks coming over, or, or European trucks that race in the European Championship, but a British, British round. So John Neal's coming back to race with us. Um, Mark Taylor's coming back to race with us. We've got William Breedrick coming back. Um, that's the the Flying Dutchman. And then we've got Mick and Mackinen coming over with the Mad Croc truck. So we've actually got some some Europeans coming over. Um, so I think there's 12, 12 trucks out on that grid and nineteen out on the British. So. Um, I think it's 10, 10 truck races over the weekend. Um, and it's going to be a, an absolute spectacle. I, I don't know if you've been to the event before, but it's the, the off track. Um, there's, there's about 2,000 show trucks. They all go over into the center and the paddock. Yeah. Um, and it's it's just absolutely mad um, how many show trucks and, and the, the show and shine trucks turn up for the, the displays. It's um, by far the biggest one they host, they host all year. So... Um, well, I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna be there for that one, David. But for anybody who can't get themselves up to Donington Park, uh, you will be able to watch a live stream as well on you the will. Park YouTube channel. So uh, do make sure you head over to the BARC's YouTube channel if you want to watch that because it is going to be an absolute corker. Apologise in advance because you will see my face as well. So uh, there's uh, it's not all good news, I'm afraid. 
Uh, now, I can't believe, David, how uh, busy this weekend is for the BARC because Croft is also set to play host to the Classic Touring Car Festival this weekend. It is, yeah. We've got all of the Classic Touring Car um, classes going up there, the 66, 93, 93, 03, um, Boss Thunder Jags and the Super Tourers. Um, and we've also got support from Caterham graduates. Um, so I think it'll be an absolute cracking little weekend. Hopefully they've got reasonably good weather up there for it. Um, because Croft, when it's dry, is quite possibly one of the best circuits in the country. I think it's got a bit of everything. It's got slow, fast, sweeping corners, tight corners, bank corners, you name it. Um, and um, I think classic touring cars will get a really good reception up there, to be totally, totally honest with you. Uh, and as far as BARC news over the last couple of weeks is concerned, um, the, the provisional calendar for the British Endurance Championship has been confirmed. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that um, was published online earlier this week. Um, I can see that they're going to all of the good circuits, the, the Donningtons and the Silverstones and the Grand Hatches. I think they've got to Snetterton twice as well, um, which I think is fantastic. I absolutely love Snetterton. Um, I love um, I love growing up there, but um, I think, yeah, I think Claire's going into, is this year three? Next year will be year three of the yes. BEC. Um, and I think some of the cars they get are just fantastic. I mean, that Vulcan's just, oh, it sounds amazing, sounds really doesn't it? <laughs> um, and I think, you know, it'll just get busier and busier. I think Claire's doing a really good job building building the um, the BEC Championship up and, um, you know, hopefully eventually get to sort of full grids and lots of Ferraris and Porsches and lovely supercars for us all to watch. Yeah, it is a fantastic uh, series that to very much enjoy. Uh, working quite closely with Claire and the team. Uh, David, usually we talk about uh, the likes of Formula One to motoring journalists, uh, but it'd be good to get a different opinion on the championship from someone else, especially as now we are in the summer break. So what have you made of the first uh, 10 races uh, we've had so far, haven't we? Um, yeah. Um, a bit repetitive, but I think that's Formula One. If you, if you look at history, Formula One's actually a very, very, very com um, repetitive repetitive series you tend to get one driver who actually um, seems to have a, a, a reasonably long winning streak I mean Ted Hamilton Vettel Schumacher um, even before that you know, Prost and Senna they were swapping championships and everything like that so um, I, I, I would love to see Formula 1 um, I, I think the, the whole move to ground effects the, the idea is correct I just don't think it's been executed very well um, I'd like to see DRS go um, and I think that would help cars um, actually do some proper overtaking. I'm not a fan of just having having a um, DRS wing open and being able to drive past somebody so um, I do think they, they need to tweak it a little bit to make it make it a little bit more exciting but um, yeah, repetitive is the word I would use. Well I asked this question to everybody uh, David, when we touch on Formula One, and as we know, Red Bull have won every race so far this season. Uh, I thought last time out in Belgium, it, it might change actually with Verstappen starting a little bit further back, but uh, uh, as I suppose a little bit expected, he did come through to win. Are Red Bull going to win every race this season? That's a good question. It's possible. It's possible, but I, I wouldn't like to to make a prediction just yet. That's all right. I hope that fence is uh, comfortable, David, for you. I, I th yeah, it's it's a funny one, isn't it? Because um, you've you've got to applaud them for being so far yeah. ahead and for Max being such a good driver. Um, but if you actually look at the points table and you take Max out of the equation altogether, just taking out the equation does not exist. Um, I think it'd actually be a really exciting, close, contested championship. I just think he's that he's that good and, and that much quicker than everybody else that um he, he just you know he, he walks every win for fun um I don't know what Formula One do about that it's 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 hard to it's it's hard to say it's wrong because the guy's just doing his job and he's doing it well, to the best of his abilities fault, no no and I don't and think it's, it's Red, Red Bull's fault, fault either no you know? no not at all but I think I think the rule makers need to to have a little look at it I think they're going in the right direction um I think to, to, to bring in some more overtaking, I would get rid of carbon brakes and, and go to some steel brakes. Trying to extend the braking zone, basically, that's that's where I think you'd, you'd be better off 
um, looking at from a technical point of view to, to make some more overtakes or sort of make know, some more natural organic overtakes. I know what you mean, David, when you talk about the, the um, DRS, um, because w what DRS has is a, in effect done is to make overtaking predictable. It was meant to make overtaking easier, but what it's done is to make it a certainty. I think yeah. I think the problem is DRS is a leftover from a from a previous rule set. Different era. Yeah. Um, a completely different era, different engines, different way of generating downforce. And I think the problem with DRS is it it it's, it, it worked in 2010, 11, or, or, or when they brought it in. Um, but when the cars changed to the to the latest specifications with the the, the ground tunnels and the venturis, I think um, DRS is just too much of a an enabler. And like I said, I think you need to, to come back to a, a way of, of creating organic overtakes. And I think for me personally, looking at it all, I think the best way to do that is by making the cars break over a lot longer distance. Um, it, it's almost like the Citroen C1s. When I, when I raced those a couple of years back, it was really hard to overtake someone on the brakes because when you're breaking that late for a corner, it you can't outbreak somebody because... You're already at the corner basically when you're braking, and it's very similar in Formula One there, where they're braking from 200 plus miles an hour in 75 meters. When I was a kid, that would be 150 meters. It'd be double the braking distance, and um, therefore you had organic overtakes, natural overtakes on the brakes. So I think. So that's what we need to do is to get Stefano Domenicali to come along to a Citroen C1 race and say, "This is how you do it." I, I've, I think we need to get him on this podcast, Alan. <laughs> we'll just sit him down and just t sit him down and tell him straight what he needs to do. I'm not, I'm not sure that's going to happen, <laughs> but we could certainly contact his people. We can ask. We can ask a question, can't we? I, I think the solution might be uh, be quite simple, really. I think maybe we're overthinking things. Maybe just give each driver three banana skins that they can chuck on the track at any time. <laughs> Uh, that might spice things up a little bit. You've been playing Mario. Uh, yes. Is it that obvious, Alan? Is yeah, it I'm that afraid obvious? so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, right, David, thank you so much for joining us uh, once again on the Barking Mad podcast. Of course, the weekend of the 12th, 13th of August. Boy, oh boy, there's a lot going on for Bark. Uh, events taking place at Donington Park, Knock Hill and Cross. So I better let you go, David, because you're going to be a very busy man indeed. Thanks for joining us once again on the Barking Mad podcast. No worries, guys. Thanks for your time. Now, our next guest is someone that has a real eye for detail and a delicate touch on the weekdays. And then at the weekend, he's launching over curbs and going wheel to wheel in minis. It's a pleasure to welcome to the Barking Mad podcast, renowned crash helmet designer and painter and race driver, Joe Tanner. Hiya, Joe. Thank Hi, Joe. you. Nice to be here. What an introduction. <laughs> I'm, not sure. I'm not sure it was accurate. <laughs> what what are you first and foremost? What do you see yourself as first and foremost? It's funny because I've always wanted to be a racing driver as when you're growing up as a child, you want to be a racing driver. But what happens now is people come up to me and they say, oh, are you? And I'm thinking they're going to say, are you a racing driver? And they go, are you the guy that paints crash helmets? And I said to someone the other day when I was at a race meeting and people were coming over and asking about helmets, I said, oh, I'm, I'm never going to be a racing driver. I'm always going to be a, a helmet painter, which is fine. I suppose I accidentally found my niche in the industry and uh, but I love the racing and initially like this business was in the very early days was just to try to find some budget to go racing yes. and it, yeah, it's yeah. just taken over. Has, uh, have you always had an interest in motorsport period from little boy on? Oh yeah of course yeah I'm the classic case of went to a Grand Prix in the early 90s with my dad and then thought well I'm going to be a Formula One driver and chased it forever formula ford which is where i was scotch champion in like the mid 2000s i'm a lot older than i look i think i get told i was scottish champion back then and i was chasing the way to be joe yeah <laughs> i was i was chasing it um and, and it becomes when you get involved in motorsport you start to drive things you realize hang on a minute i'm not in a position where we're going to be even an f3 budget was ridiculous i did a little bit of formula renault uk championship but you're like hang on this isn't gonna work this way for me um, and then it was just kind of exploring different avenues is kind of where the helmets came from. I suppose you talk about exploring different avenues there, Joe, because there's multiple routes in motorsport. 
perhaps helmet painting and design is, is a slightly different route. How did you first realize you got a bit of a talent for this? So I've always been a little bit artistic. Um, I went to art college briefly. I didn't even finish the course, but I enjoyed the graphics part of it, which is quite similar to what I'm actually doing, just the graphics side of it. Um, so I was working at Knock Hill as a race instructor, probably about 13 years. I was happy in my job, had a good salary, and I, I was fine just being a race instructor and trying to scrape together money to, to race. And it was still chasing the single seater dream at the time. Um, and then I thought, as a hobby, I'm going to start painting crash helmets, just as a hobby. So I went down south, did a course. It was a two-day course, the do's and the don'ts. Did the course, came back up the road, and at the time, Sorry, Joe, I was racing in... a helmet design course. A specific yeah, they're not popular. Course. Yeah, they're not popular. I was the only person on, How many on the course. On it, I was the only person on the <laughs> course. Joe. I don't think they do it anymore. It was it was in, and he was a really nice guy, and it was in his shed at the end of his garden in Coventry. Okay. And I went there, and I I learned, and I learned a lot to be fair, because I didn't know anything about paints. I'm not from this industry. I just wanted to put a nice design on a helmet. So I did that. Um, when I came back, it was 2009 and I was racing Formula Ford at the time with Rory Butcher. And it was me and him for the championship. And I had a painted helmet. He didn't. He had a plain white Arai. And I said to Rory, I'll paint your one. So he said, oh, fine. I quite like what Kimi Raikkonen has at the moment. Put the Kimi Raikkonen design on Rory's helmet. Within six months of that happening, I was full time. I had 30 or 40 helmets. And it, I think wow. it was because of my situation with my circle of friends at the time, which was everyone at Knock Hill, Johnny Adam and Gordon Shedden and all these people, they saw the opportunity for a free paint job from their mate, basically, which is what it was in the beginning. And I was just inundated with, with stuff. So this went on for a while, but I really liked my job at Knock Hill and I was happy doing what I was doing, but I didn't want to leave because I was too scared to leave a, you know, a solid job that I'd been at forever. So I was painting at nighttime, like all night, and then just living on Red Bull, walking back across, doing a shift at Knock Hill. And then wow. eventually, uh, Gillian Shedden, pulled me, who's the manager of the circuit, owns the circuit, she pulled me into the office and said, today is your last day. I'm not sacked, but there's no notice. Just stop and go and go and do the crash helmets. And that's when this unit that I'm sat in, which is unit seven at Knock Hill, this had come up for grabs. I didn't know. She said, there's a unit over there the state of you, you've not slept in three months, just go and do the business. So I got pushed into this by Gillian yeah, <laughs> rather than Gillian. actually making that big manly decision, basically. <laughs> yeah, wow. Well, I mean, what a, what a fascinating yeah, that's story. That's how it happened. Um, so, so, so you said um, that there was a course uh, that amused us all greatly, um, and it was about the do's and don'ts. What, what, what are the do's and don'ts? Well, at the end of the day, it's a safety device. So you can't go doing things that's going to jeopardize the safety of the helmet. So there's mm -hmm. certain things that you can't remove. Basically, as a painter, we're trying to remove as little as possible, but still be able to get a clean edge on like rubber trims and visor trims and things. But it's more about basically what you're not allowed to do. You're not allowed to let any paint penetrate the shell of the helmet to the internals, the polystyrene and stuff can be affected by the chemicals. So it was more that covering the, yes, the, the sort of aspects. do's and don'ts yeah. of it. Um, and I did a lot of BSB. When I first started, it was it was a lot of BSB helmets because Gordon Shedden had a good contact at Arai at the time, but he was looking for a painter for super bikes. And I sort of took on that. I don't do it anymore because it's a disposable item for these guys. And you were doing constantly. They, they always need three. They drop them in a wet free practice session on Friday morning. You've got to get them another one. It's a nightmare. But I did start with BSB and that was really important because it, they're, I mean, yes, it's a protective item in a car, but in, in super bikes, these guys are using these things to save their life. So the safety side of it was drilled into me quite early on. Yeah. I like the fact actually, Joe, that you think Coventry's down south. Uh, that's, that's up north. <laughs> is that northern, is it? So. <laughs> it was about eight hours away, so it felt south. It's, it's kind of in the middle. <laughs> if I, if I race anywhere, just... anywhere south of Alton, I'll fly. I, I would I would fly to Orton if I could. I just hate driving, surprisingly. <laughs> yeah, we're doing the road trip to Knock Hill tomorrow, Joe. I mean, you. I know. You, it's nice you here. It's nice, sunny. Is it? Is it really? Yeah. Is it going to be sunny Cold at the weekend? Sunny. Um, no, I think the forecast says like fifty percent chance of rain. Oh, so that's. We'll see. 
Uh, I'll take that. I'll, t- I'll take 50%. Yeah, 50%. Can, can, it's not 100. Can you, so we talk about painting helmets. Can, can you take us through the process of your, presumably there are plenty of different, well, there are different artists that use, some use knives, some use brushes, some use spray paints. What is, what is your process? What is your, um, your particular style? I'm say I'm, I'm pretty traditional. I do see a lot of these people using paintbrushes and crazy techniques, but it was never my thing, to be honest, to be doing that. I'm very much the big gun and the airbrush, fine line tape, and I'm quite graphic y. Like, I'm not in any way an airbrush artist, which I get confused with. An airbrush artist will do a clown or a dragon or a skull. That's not what I do. I use the airbrush for shading and effects and things. Um, so I'd say it was pretty traditional. Sometimes we'll get something where I do have to venture into splatting paint with a brush or using like a sponge or something. And it's totally experimental because it's kind of out of my comfort zone. But we do sometimes do that. Um, and then we've moved on now. Things are developing into like sort of water slide decals and things like that that we're trying to experiment with for different effects and stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm not in any way a freehand artist. I could not paint like a horse or whatever no. you see these amazing no, no. airbrush artists no. doing. And I don't, I don't sell myself as that. It's very graphic what I do, I think. So, Joe, you said we a couple of times there. Is it a team of people? Is it just, just you? And, and how long does it take to do a helmet from start to finish? Um, so it's hard to, it's hard to put a time on it because it totally depends on the design and it depends on the mood that I'm in and how yeah. much messing around I do in between stages, which I found is quite a lot. <laughs> There used to be two full-time painters here. It was myself and early on in starting the business was a guy called Didi. He was Turkish and he was here for just over 10 years. He left last year and went back to Turkey. So it's just me painting at the moment. And I've tried, I've built up, built up such a customer base now that I didn't want to let anybody down. So this year in particular has been really difficult because I've tried to do the same volume without my second painter. And I think in truth, I've realized how much he actually did. I'll go to a race meeting on a Wednesday or a Thursday, leave him two or three helmets and things I need doing on those helmets. I'd come back and he'd always have it done. <laughs> now it's when I go, it's a standstill. But I do have Hannah Chapman here full time. Um, Hannah does the complete running of the business. The place where I was really struggling and really weak was yeah. admin, bookings, invoicing, all these kind of things. I've walked across the paddock before and seen someone wearing a helmet and suddenly realized they never paid for it because I never I sent them invoice. I have a bill for that. Like, I, <laughs> I, yeah. yeah, but Hannah has made such a big difference to, to that well, side of it. Um, and also Hannah, yeah, well, she does the a boring side. That's why. It's the part I never learned. I mean, uh, yeah, it, it was just a, a hobby business that got out of hand really, really quickly. But um, yeah, it, it seems to work well at the moment. I, I would like to have an, another painter, but it's so difficult to find one. Because if you can do this, you just do it for yourself. So, so, uh, Joe, give us an idea of numbers. Uh, uh, you, you talked about the, the the amount of of helmets that need to be painted. Can you can you give us a, a, an average um, um, during season uh, over the course month? of a year? Yeah, I should know this, shouldn't I? I don't know. I mean, at the we'll minute, we're November. We're taking She'll bookings know. for November. The shutters are down just outside, <laughs> guarding so no one comes in. Um, right. <laughs> I would say it's got to be a it's got to be a hundred on like a normal year. It's got to be a hundred. But I've wow. done big manufacturer jobs for like I did a big job for Jaguar in 2015, and we did 460 something helmets for oh, one of their production goodness. cars. And we do get like these mass these mass produced manufacturer jobs as well, um, which aren't. A huge amount of fun as you can imagine just reproducing the same thing over and over and over again um, but i would say probably on average over the years probably a hundred a year i think would be kind of realistic so one every three or four days that's, that's yeah uh, that's quite a lot isn't it really yeah. on average that's that's, yeah. that's quite something well, i only live six or seven miles from here so a lot of the times i can work the, in the evenings and i quite like an evening shift because no one comes in no one bothers you yes i'm at a racetrack so you can imagine the constant flow of people that come in and uh, I'll sometimes go home, put my son to bed, and then come back up and just work into the evening. And I quite enjoy it. Gets me out of the house. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> gets you out of the house. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's talk, uh, Joe Shawetchi, about some of the uh, some of the helmets that you have painted down the years as well, because you've done quite a few famous faces, haven't you? Um, yeah, and again, I think that's down to 
the being in the industry, I think. Um, we did get, we have done a few celebrity people and whatnot. Um, I'm doing one for Richard Hammond right now, and we've done like Paul Hollywood and people like that. But in terms of like motorsport people, do you want me to name drop? Is that what we're doing? Yeah, please. I'll I can, I can yeah, name, drop. For name drop. Name drop. Uh, yeah, Lando Norris's helmets in F3 we did. Um, when Lando moved into Formula One, he had to go with the McLaren painter or a different painter. Um, which is fine, um, but he was really good to work with in F3 and kind of let you do, you know, some really cool stuff. Um, Nigel Mansell last year was the best one because he oh, cool. he was doing, he drove the 92 Williams up the hill. Um, but that's a proper MSA event, Goodwood. But he all his helmets were really old, so he needed a modern course, RI, yeah. like a new yeah. one that was in date that needed to be in his paint job. Um, so I got a phone call from someone asking me to do it, but I thought they were winding me up. It's like, it's just typical, oh, do you want to paint Nigel Mansell's helmet? And I was like, oh, yeah. Uh, but it turned out it really was was that. Um, and, if, and I did if, that if, last if, year, which was really When you were cool. a boy, you were going to Grand Prix in the early 1990s. He was the hero, yeah. wasn't he? I know. Yeah, I was a huge Nigel Mansell fan. So that was quite a fanboy moment for me, yeah, I, I think. So. Um, and he was, yeah, I didn't really deal with him much. It was sort of, there was a middleman involved. But um, yeah, he was really, he was really good. Paul Hollywood must have been cool as well. What was it? A giant life of bread or something on the side? No, it wasn't. It was really traditional. It was like a it was like a Union Jack thing. But he did a he had a TV program, like a driving program, quite a while ago that yeah. I think it was for. And I watched the program once, and he had the helmet on in the car with a GoPro pointing back at him on like BBC Two prime time, and it had my Rennet Design visor sticker on. And I was like, oh, look at that! And then in the next shot, it was gone. <laughs> so obviously, someone uh. pointed out. You're giving someone a hell of a lot of advertising here. But again, he was really good. Um, who else would be done? That was good. Um, do, do you have a favourite, Joe? Do you have a favourite? Because crash helmets, they're sort of, they're a personal thing, aren't they, for a driver? And, yeah. and some of them sort of have their own sort of calling card. Is there one that sticks out for you? I think the the traditional design for a driver is dying. I think the what Vettel did a few years ago in Formula One by wearing a different paint job at every single round became really fashionable. Yeah. It's obviously a massive expense, and to put that together is difficult. I think Jake Dennis, and he won Formula E, obviously, just recently. We do all of his, and I think he's probably the closest I've got. He doesn't have one every round, but he'll have, like, a Rome special, South Africa special, the London special. So for these guys that are completely changing their design and racing with something totally unique, um, I think is, the, is where we're headed now. But this, like, Prost, Damon Hill, Senna, I, you don't really see it that much. Sometimes they'll keep the silhouette, but then they all want to change yeah, elements yeah. of it. I think if I had to pick my favorite, I get asked all the time and it's always the same answer. And I think it's probably Josh Cook's helmet that he's still using, which is like a flying cap with goggles. It and it's is open the most face. brilliant design. Absolutely <laughs> superb. It, it is my favorite. Um, <clears throat> I spoke course. about it a lot. It, I had two weeks to do it. Um, it was... I can't, I honestly can't remember if it was Josh's idea or mine. I can't remember. But I bought one of these hats off of Amazon and took all the stitching out of it and lay it flat so I could try to work out how it was going to fit on the helmet. Um, and it, it had to be right. Like, I was worried it wasn't going to be that good and it would it would have been rubbish. It needed yeah, to yes, be yeah. really, really accurate. And I think I think it worked. I think it worked pretty well. Oh, he's still chuffed with it to this day. Well, this we've got a group chat with um, Josh and Jade Edwards gets involved with ideas of like what to do next because that thing's going to run out of date. I think it's his fourth season he's used it, and every year we have a few ideas. And I think Jade and Josh were pushing a watermelon that was like cut like a pudding bowl open face, <laughs> but I just don't think it's going to work as well as the, as well as the goggles and like with Josh. Whatever I do next, it has to be awesome. Or I can't take a step back, but I don't know how to beat no, it can't. at the moment. No. I mean, it, 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 it is something he is still that. in complete love with. Um, every time yeah. I every time I interview him and he's got his helmet on, it makes me giggle, and so I mention it, and then yeah. in turn, it kind of makes him giggle as well. And I try to get him at the right angle yeah. while I'm talking to him, just so it looks perfect for his own yeah, for his own chin. Line up the nose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. Exactly. yes, yeah, you exactly. got to line up. Yeah, it was his, it, to get that image, he had to, he was obviously down south in his living room 
sideways and his wife was taking pictures of his face so that I could get the exact image of where his nose would sit in the helmet. And oh, I've cool. seen maybe two or three that Jacob Ebrey have done that it is perfectly lined it up. It is and it perfect, does look quite yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, yeah. It, it, it is truly brilliant. And I'm I'm not disappointed that you picked that out as a, a real speciality of, of, yeah. of, of, of the work you've done. Um, and I would say the other one, mm -hmm. uh, Nigel Mansell, that's just so cool. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah, it's um, it, it, we had a we had a guy from Williams Heritage who ran the 92 car come forward after we did Nigel's one. And he sent me I don't know if I can rake it out here, but trust me that i'm talking about an inch worth of documents here of the measurements millimeter oh, perfect yes, of how yeah. it needed to be so the one yes. I, the one i did for nigel i did really quickly from images off of google when this chap sent me two more replicas for the heritage and um, the williams heritage he sent me this document that thick one millimeter here how the red cross disappeared yeah, behind wow. the visor and i realized all of a sudden the one i did for nigel that he wore was a mile off was way it was, out, but it looked it right. Meant it, to be. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. looked right. It, yeah. He was happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And when I saw it, right. I thought, "Oh well, that's got to be a modern helmet." So I wonder who, wonder who did that. And there we go. Now we know. Yeah, myself. that was me. Yeah. Uh, can, can you yeah. um can you spill the beans, Joe, on what you're working on at the moment? Um, I've got Richard Hammond's one there. I've got Ronan Pearson is wearing a one-off special for um, Macklin Motors this weekend, which is being launched on Saturday. So I'm trying to keep that under wraps. Um, Stefan Hodgetts has got a new one there for his karting that he's doing. I've got an Italian chap here. And I need to think, what is it, Tuesday? I need to think of something for me because I have to do, I'm wearing a different helmet at every round. And genuinely, 20 past two, uh, Tuesday, I don't know what I'm doing yet, so I need to do one for me before was Friday. It was it last year? It was. A, was it last year? It was a pink helmet uh, for something really quite specific. Yes, yeah, that was for Molly, um, who's a friend of mine's daughter. Um, who was really ill and has really sadly since passed away. So I've uh, we, that that wearing that pink helmet last year was uh, was quite a special one. Uh, this year, I've got an idea, but yeah, I haven't got a lot of time. Is there anybody, Joe, you've mentioned, I mean, you've, you've done some designs for some incredible names out there. Is there anybody on your bucket list, somebody who, if you got the call, would just be like, oh my word, I can't believe they want me to do that for them? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I would like to have a Formula One driver, but it's not what everybody thinks. Everyone thinks like, oh, one day you'll do a Formula One driver. A lot of them, you're well, some of the really big names, you're paying them for the pleasure of doing it yeah. for the advertising um, and the majority aren't paying and they need eight a year minimum plus their specials. It's an industry that is like, I can see myself having a major meltdown if I ended up with a Formula One driver just with the pressure and the stress of having to do it. But if I did have to pick a Formula One driver to have Lando again, I think what he yeah. does with the helmets is, you know, he really does have a different one pretty much at every single round, which I really like. And it gives you the chance to do so much but again, that's kind of what I'm doing with the with the mini stuff. So I get the chance to do it on my own helmets. Yeah, that's cool. And we and we've made plenty of reference, uh, including a, a new helmet designed to be uh, um, to be launched for Ronan Pearson this weekend. It's touring cars at Knock Hill. We've, we've mentioned it as uh, already in this uh, in this interview. Um, and of course, that means minis are in action as well. So, at what time do you hang up your aerosol can and um, and pick up your own helmet? <laughs> Honestly, last night I looked at the free practice timetable for Friday to see if I had time in the morning to, to work in the morning before we have to go, I swear to God, because that would mean I would, with terms of do my own one, I need to allocate time to put it all back together. And it's going to be Wednesday tomorrow. I don't know. I'll probably work early in the morning on Friday um, and then and then jump in the car. And, and then so I, you I, deserve I, a rest. You deserve a rest, Joe. It's flat it's out. Honestly. It's, it's flat <laughs> out. But I do it to myself. Everyone says I always bite off more than I can chew, and they're they're normally right. Joe Tanner helmet designs <laughs> powered by Iron Brew, I would imagine. In fact, that was that not a design of yours? Was that was that on your helmet? As yes. Yeah, it's right there. I shot my Iron Brew helmet. Yeah, um, I'm not allowed to wear it. I had to gaffer tape it up the, the logo <laughs> on the front of it. But yeah, I love my Iron Brew helmet. Um, somebody tried to buy it off me, and I wouldn't sell it to them because they they wanted to use it in another championship and. 
I love it. I think I'll just keep that one forever. Yeah, I really I think like you it. Should, you should keep um, that. Um, I, w- I was also going to ask: Do people buy? Do do, do people buy a design off you, or, or um, engage your services to paint a helmet just for a piece of artwork? Because it would be um, a fantastic piece of artwork. It would, wouldn't it? What a gift that would be, mm. by the way. Here's a mm. whole new arm to the business, Joe. Yeah, that, I know. <laughs> Not really. A lot of them will use it so that it's got some kind of meaning behind it, as yes. I won this with it, I did that with it, whatever. Um, Jake Dennis, um, he won, obviously, the, what do you call it? Formula, Formula E. e. Apologies. <laughs> the Formula E Championship. <laughs> um, so we're doing one for the... What did I see the other day? An email about um, there's a, a wall of British champions somewhere in the MSA somewhere. They've got a wall of champions where basically every British champion has a helmet on the wall from like Damon Hill and every yes. single world champion yeah. driver. I didn't know this existed, but how cool would that be? So they've asked me to paint one for Jake, a replica, so it can go on the wall as a British nice. world champion. Oh. I thought that was really cool, but I didn't even know that existed. Um, so, yeah, there, there is occasions where we'll paint something that, you know, will never, ever, ever be worn. But it's not very often. No. Not very often. No. We're doing one for um, uh, an Aston Martin driver at the moment. That I don't probably not supposed to say who it is, so I won't. But no. it's to go in the Aston Martin lobby. Um, yeah, but not very. Not. But they're so expensive. Like these carbon fiber helmets are three, four thousand pounds each. Yeah. Wow. So it's wow. it's yeah, they're expensive. Oh, I've just seen uh, as well. There's actually for what you do, there is an award, isn't there? There's the helmet painter of the year and you won the european helmet painter of the year yeah that was 2016 when i was just a lad and that i won that one for lando norris and i don't want to mess with your setup if i turn my screen that's the lando one there on my wall it had like a casino up on the top of it that's him at macau um yeah the award i won for that one excuse me while i pull this back there we go (laughs) yeah i won the award for that one at the autosport show and it was judged by tim sugden of all people <laughs> but he liked it so i won <laughs> oh cool uh, right now um in, in, in important business um obviously your day hobby we've dealt with um what hopes have you got for the mini this weekend need to win a race it's getting a bit embarrassing now to be honest i think i've been second seven times um yeah it, it's it's funny because everyone's like oh well this is your place to win but I just had my lunch up there with Dan Zilos, who's out testing today because it's an official mini test day. I'm working. He's testing. This is his favorite circuit. He's had so much success here. I'm like, the guy that's beating me every single weekend, I'm finished second to all year at circuits that he knows. And now I've got a funny feeling he's going to beat me in my back garden in front of all my friends and family. No, but you go well at Nokia. <laughs> but I, don't, I, don't, I don't mind. <laughs> I don't mind. It's, you uh, do go well at Nokia yeah, right? historically, I, don't you? Historically, yeah, generally touch wood, it, it sometimes goes well. But in this championship, it's so competitive. Like if you have a bad qualifying and qualify seventh, it's game over. You can't recover. Everybody's too fast. If you have a mechanical, if you throw it off the road, I'm making a lot of excuses here in preparation. I hope, <laughs> I hope it goes well, but I'm not going to do what I normally do and overload myself with home pressure. I'll just try to have fun, get through it and just try to get to Monday. Okay, now Ian is going to ask you a question, yeah. uh, our final question of, of you, Joe. Um, and if I just give you a tip, I'll be very disappointed if it, it isn't one that relates to Knock Hill. Okay, Ian. Yes. Now, there you go. A bit of a clue there, Joe. What we're doing here for the Barking Mad podcast is building out our ultimate race circuit throughout the course of the year so we're asking our guests to name one corner their favorite corner can be any circuit in the world we're going to add it to our dream race circuit shall we say <laughs> it's gone um i'm not going to go with the traditional yeah the traditional one would be the chicane at knock hill but i'm not going to do that i'm going to say clark's the right hander at the back clark's for me is my strongest corner i have no idea why Ever since I drove around here in the early 2000s in Formula Ford, everyone has always said, I just can't touch you through Clarks. I don't know why. It just makes sense to me. And I've always been strong there. I like the corner. I'm going with Clarks at Knock Hill. And I've kind of pushed you into... You to, Knock Hill's doing well. Yeah, no, I've kind of pushed you into a Knock Hill corner scenario. Would that be your favourite corner of any? Uh, no, I don't think it would. Where do I like? Uh, Joe can have two corners. I love Alton. 
Yeah, yeah, I love Alton a lot. It's going to be a big circuit. Yeah. What do I like at Alton? Uh, I quite like Druids at Alton. And I'm not traditionally the bravest driver. I'm normally quite strong in low speed, medium speed. But at something about Druids at Alton I really like. It's a good corner. I think if, if the car is right. If the car is not right, then it's terrifying. But if the car is right and it's a qualifying lap with new rubber, um, Druids is pretty, pretty cool. Nice. Good choice. Joe, it's been absolutely fantastic having a chat. I'm sorry we've kept you away. Was that your lunch break and now you're back on it till 12 o'clock tonight or something like that? Yeah, it's fine. Don't worry. It's normal. <laughs> I live here pretty much. Well, it's, I mean, it's been a, a, a real insight. How many, um, final question, how many of you are there in the UK? How many helmet painters, professional helmet painters are there? I, the honest answer is I don't know, but it, it depends where the cutoff is for professional and full time. I think there's probably five or six right. doing the volume that I'm doing. I think yes. we've got a group chat of five or six that we all kind of keep in touch and whatnot. But there's loads of people out there starting off. There's loads of people in garden sheds. There's loads. Of, there is loads of options out there. So Super. don't try me. I'm joking. <laughs> Joe, stop it. <laughs> Go to Joe. <laughs> Absolutely superb yeah. insight, though, Joe. Uh, really, really interesting stuff. Can't wait to see the design that you're wearing uh, at the weekend. And uh, uh, one, it looks smart and uh, and fancy when you're on the top step of the podium. No pressure there at your home circuit, is there? Oh. Hey, goodness oh. me. I'll see you there. <laughs> Joe, good luck at the weekend. And I'll thank try. you so much for giving us an Thanks, insight guys. into the world of helmet painting. Uh, Joe Tanner, everybody here on the Barking Mad podcast. Well, Ian, that's sadly all we've got time for in this edition of the Barking Mad podcast. But before we go, there's time once again to tell you about our partners, BP Fleet Solutions UK, who allow you to invest less on fuel and more on winning. Now, the Bark podcast is proud to be aligned with BP Fleet Solutions UK to bring both Bark members and podcast listeners exclusive discounts on UK fuel. Yeah, the BP Plus Fuel and Charge card can be used by anyone. Individuals, race teams, SMEs and entire vehicle fleets can access great savings at BP Fuel Stations. The collaborations between Bark and BP marks a significant milestone in providing benefits to racing drivers, teams and their associated businesses. Now, if you're a Bark member and want to find out more, just head to bp.com slash BARC. If you need any help at all, hit the callback button on the website and a member of the BP Fleet Solution UK team will contact you. Excellent stuff. And just a quick reminder as well, the Draper Tours competition that we were running in the last podcast has now closed. Uh, so please don't enter it now. We will be in touch with the winner very, very shortly though. Uh, Alan, I really enjoyed this podcast though. Uh, I hope you had a good time as well. As ever, um, a fifth podcast is complete in the can, as they say. And we'll be back in two weeks' time for another episode of the Barking Mad podcast. Um, so I'm uh, starting the road trip up to up to Knock Hill tomorrow, <laughs> which is always a fantastic trip. Um, everyone makes us feel so welcome. The, the 1.2-mile Knock Hill circuit is a roller coaster for touring cars. It's always a brilliant weekend, so I'm off there. Uh, you're up to Donington Park to see the big rigs. I am Donington Park bound. Yes. And don't forget that will be live uh, on YouTube at the BARC's YouTube channel. So do make sure you check it out. Uh, there's absolutely lots to be excited about, especially when it comes to the sheer amount of bark race meetings that we've got coming up over the coming weeks as well. And and just to remind you, everybody, uh, we mentioned it at the start of the podcast, um, your favourite circuit personal reasons oh, yes. uh, can be included in the comments as well uh, at the bottom of uh, of this video it'd be really intriguing to to find out your own reasons to uh, love one circuit more than any other on the planet uh, there's lots of events to come and that means we've got lots to talk about on the next episode which will be back in a fortnight's time so if you're as barking mad as me and ian uh, then <laughs> don't forget you can also watch each episode of the podcast on the barc youtube channel in the meantime with lots going on over the next couple of weeks be sure to stay up to date with all the latest news across the barc website and social media channels uh, but until next time from ian and from myself it's goodbye goodbye oh, 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 oh.